And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, welcome to a special, and I mean really, a special podcast, because we have something new and different uh, for our uh, folks who are following our portfolios. And uh, Chris has developed something uh, that I think you are going to like. And so, Chris, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand this over to you. I guess before I do, before I do, I just want to say that, that we rolled along for uh, about seven years, mostly uh, being work that, that I had done in my past life. Uh, and uh, and then Chris and Daryl joined and 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 really have taken us to the next step in terms of portfolio uh, construction, uh, information and, and 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 studies that that show these particular portfolios, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and try to help you make the best decision that you can. But there are some things where we're still stuck way back when I started this thing uh, 10 years ago. And so, Chris, I'm going to ask you to introduce the Portfolio Configurator. Take it away. All right. So, uh, first of all, thanks for the introduction. And uh, I think this is kind of an interesting thing for us to talk about. Uh, we're going to be talking about. Uh, something that could replace the pre-calculated portfolios that we already have on the website. Uh, so some of you have gone to our Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab or T. Rowe Price pages under our best, uh, I think it's our portfolio recommendations. And we've had these pre-calculated uh, conservative, moderate and aggressive portfolios. And uh, every couple of years, Paul and I revisit them and, and try to update them. And it's a very manual process. And we've also had a calculator. Uh, the calculator lets you customize your configuration, customize how much you have in equities and how much and which portfolio strategy you want to use. Uh, that portfolio calculator was created using a Google Sheet. And as those of you who've used it know, uh, you have to copy it into your Google account to use it. And so I wanted to get past that. I wanted to create something that was easier to use. And, and in fact, I have hundreds over the couple of years we've had that one up, hundreds of requests to edit it. And I can't grant that because if you could edit it, you'd be able to, everybody else would see your edits. So instead, um, we I'm planning to replace it and proposing we replace potentially both of those things with this thing I'm calling a configurator. And let me let me just share it. So here you go. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's uh, I've got up here, I've called it the Sound Investing Fixed Allocation Portfolio Configurator. And the instructions are on the right hand side. Uh, it says you select a portfolio strategy, then you select uh, an account tax status, whether it's a taxable or a tax deferred account. You set the fixed income percentage you want. You select your fund family. And at that point, um, you will be able to see the fund allocations and the fund tickers and the fund names that you would use to implement that. Uh, and it, there's some encouragement here to play and compare and I'll show you why and a reminder that there's a button up here at the top called reset that lets you go back to the beginning. So if you get it all messed up and you're confused, you can just reset. So let's see how that works. Let's say you wanted to invest in an ultimate buy and hold 50-50 US and international portfolio and you wanted to do it in a tax deferred account like a 401k or an IRA um, and you wanted a 40% uh, fixed income percentage, and you wanted to do it with the best in class ETFs. So I've now made those four selections and you see over on the right hand side, all of the funds that you would potentially use to do that. This uses the best in class ETFs because that's what we selected. And you can see the asset class here on the left. 
And if these all these jumble of letters are confusing to you, up on the top left hand side, there's a glossary link, and you can see what they all what they all mean, what they stand for. We'll go back to the configurator page. And you can see how much you would invest in each one of them, uh, what the asset allocation is, and you can see the fixed income down here at the bottom. And you can also see that some asset classes aren't represented, and that's because uh, they are associated with particular fund families or different strategies. And if you wanted to switch, you could go to the US four fund um, and boom, there you go. Now you have a new asset allocation. And for whichever one you choose, we'll go back to uh, an ultimate buy and hold 7030 just to mix it up. Uh, you can also see the resulting key portfolio attributes. Now this was based on Morningstar data taken um, just uh, in July of this year. So it's mostly for comparison. If you want up-to-date data, you'd have to go and gather the up-to-date data. We don't have licenses for the up-to-date information. But you can see what the expense ratio was for that portfolio in July. And for comparison purposes, you could compare that, for example, to the US 4 fund. We'll switch back and you can see the US 4 fund is 0.14% and the US buy and hold 7030 is 0.16%, so slightly higher. You can also see what the price to earnings was, the yield, um, the US international split that is actually re realized in that portfolio. And you can see um, below that something that's a little bit like the Morningstar style box representation of the portfolio. So for all of the equities, we have a plot here that shows how valuey the portfolio is and how big or small it is. And you can see the little dot here representing the portfolio we've chosen. Um, and then you can see the fixed income in kind of a similar a similar way where you can tell that they're very safe bonds because they have a high credit rating and they're intermediate term when you take the whole basket together, which is the kind of bonds we'd normally want in this sort of a portfolio. Um, the really cool thing, and this is why I encourage you to play with it, is if you go up and you reset and you go back to the top, and you take it back to the beginning, it actually shows all of the portfolios. And so you can look in here and you can see uh, that the ones that have the smallest, most value orientation are these all small cap value portfolios. And you can see um, that the ones that are you know big, but still value tilted are the all value, not all small cap value. Um, and then you can have fun with it and do things like compare all of those portfolios within the best in class uh, family of ETFs. And you can see that those mostly are biased towards kind of a, a value tilt with a little bit smaller companies. Um, but you can look and say, well, how do they compare to the Vanguard funds? And if you, if you look at Vanguard, well, Vanguard tends to be a little bit bigger and a little bit less value. Um, you can look at Fidelity. Uh, Fidelity is similar to Vanguard. Schwab is similar to Vanguard, maybe a little bit less valuey. Uh, T. Rowe Price is actually the biggest and the least valuey. Um, so you can play around and look at all of these and compare them. And uh, what I'm going to encourage Margie to do is put this up on our website as a beta release and solicit your feedback. I would love to know whether you think this is an improvement over the old calculator or not. That's the first thing. Uh, second, whether there are things you would change about it. And then third, do we need to continue maintaining those old uh, web pages where we pre-calculate the conservative, the moderate, and the aggressive, or is this okay as a replacement for all of those? Uh, because uh, there's a lot of manual work involved in doing those individual pages. So um, I hope you find it interesting. I, I think it is uh, a, a great step forward and a great learning tool uh, because it, it's something you can play with and explore these different solutions and see how they compare one to another in a way that previously we couldn't see. Now that's terrific. I, I, uh, I love the work that you've, that you've done here, Chris. Uh, and what it did for me, uh, I was, you know, immediately 
but comparing T Row Price to to Vanguard and the and the best in class, and it is quite interesting how very different they are in terms of accessing. Uh, those important asset classes that the academics have taught us uh, we should be trying to do. So it, it, it is going to, uh, uh, to create some, maybe some rethinking about how we handle some of these portfolios, remembering that the reason we had T. Rowe Price and Vanguard and Schwab and, and, and Fidelity was we were trying to accommodate people who had 401k plans that were using those fund families. Uh, and and uh, that was a very difficult thing to do because uh, e- even if you do have a Vanguard uh, series of funds, very often they did not have all the funds that we were recommending anyway. So uh, yeah, it's, been a, it's been frustrating over the years but uh, this might be an opportunity to clean it up. It certainly does, in my mind, show the potential ad- ad- advantage to people in understanding uh, how different that best-in-class configuration is uh, from, from, in essence, being stuck within uh, one particular uh, fund family. Uh, were there any particular aha moments from you, Chris, when you uh, when you were done with this, well, just going back to your comment about you know these these different fund families not being ideal choices, I've selected T Rowe Price Ultimate Buy and Hold here again, and you can see that the portfolio expense ratio is 075 percent, so it's it's very expensive, um, and you can also see over here that because we don't have an international small cap value fund, we've tried to compensate for that by putting more into large cap value to take advantage of the value tilt. But even after doing all of that and doing the best we can, you end up with this portfolio dot that is almost back up at a large cap blend fund point on the chart. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm, uh, there's sort of this balance we try to strike with this tool. On the one hand, we want to answer everybody's questions. And one of those questions is, I'm stuck with T. Rowe Price. What's the best I can do, mm-hmm. right? Um, but the other thing we want to do is be transparent and show the implications of that. If I was stuck with T. Rowe Price at these expense ratios, I'd probably invest in my 401k to the point that I got the match. And then I would invest in a different place where I could get better funds yeah. uh, because it's hard to pass up the free money. And I might even you know, go in the direction of um, an all small cap value um, uh, offering, you know, like a U.S. all small cap value offering, not because that's my total portfolio, but because at least it gets me the smallest and valuiest thing that T. Rowe Price offers, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge. So Chris, one of the questions, because we're going to do a QA and uh, a when we're done with this discussion, but one of the questions is from somebody who has been using the ultimate buy and hold strategy for, I think, over 10 years and uh, successfully uh, and, and is, is considering a changing from the ultimate buy and hold to either a four fund or maybe worldwide four fund or all U.S. Why don't you just take a second and and let's take a look here at the configurator and see what what he would learn from uh, comparing his present ultimate buy and hold versus moving to the worldwide four fund. Yeah, that's that's an interesting exercise. Uh, I wouldn't use this as the only tool, but you can use it to learn some things. So I uh, will have to make an assumption. So he's in a tax deferred account, I believe. Um, what what ask, what fund family do you think he's likely in? You know, I I don't I honestly don't know. I'm going to guess that he is not in best in class since it's some, he's put that money. I'm going to guess it's Vanguard. Let's go Uh, with Vanguard mutual funds. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if we look at the Vanguard mutual funds, uh, what we see is that the, the price to the portfolio expense ratio 
by the way, the EER is equities expense ratio. So that's just the equity part of the portfolio. But uh, assuming he's got some percent in fixed fixed income, I'm going to make that 30 just to pick a number. Uh, his portfolio expense ratio is about 0.12%. And he's got something that in aggregate, has a price to book of about 1.82 and a market cap average of 45 billion. So let's look and see if he went to a worldwide four fund 50 50, what, what changes here. So the worldwide four fund 50 50, um, it got a little bit bigger and a little bit less value. -y. It's now point, uh, 1.91 is the average price to book. The market cap is 58 billion and the expense ratio is 0.14 so it went up a little bit i mean what our back testing says is it doesn't change very much and that didn't change a lot so i wouldn't say it's going to change a lot um, but i think the question i would ask for anybody thinking about any change is what's motivating your change you know why why are you changing? And I think this person even said they didn't want to be performance chasing. Yeah, and that's, so right. That's, a, that's right. That's a good, that's a good sign. Um, if it's to go from an ultimate buy and hold to a four fund because you want to simplify and, and the uh, ultimate buy and hold is too complex for you, that would be fine. But if he's done the ultimate buy and hold all these years, he knows he can do it it might be better just to stick with it. Uh, you know, I, I don't see a lot of, I, one of the things I, I think I saw in his note that maybe we need to emphasize is that we haven't created these simpler solutions to be superior. We've created them to be easier. Yeah. Uh, the ultimate buy and hold still gives you a meaningful diversification across a wide range of, wide range of assets and uh it it gives you uh that diversification gives you uh, a smoother ride uh, now is it a dramatically smoother ride than a four fund or even a meaningful smoother ride I, I i don't know i don't i think that's beyond the resolution of our back tests but uh i would not say that the simpler strategies are better necessarily um, and I think you've said in the past, Paul, that the ultimate one is the one you'll stick with, right? So That's switching right. is always a red flag because if you switch today, then maybe you'll switch again tomorrow. Well, and I, I it may be from this gentleman or, or, or someone else, but there was also, I think, a consideration for the simplicity of it uh, for his spouse. I mean, that, oh, yeah, that's important. That aspect of it that we have to, uh, we have to consider. Uh, I think one of the most frustrating things for me is we have done this, what I think is marvelous work in helping people understand the implications of asset allocation uh, for the long term that I, I think could be, I have to say, could be a life changer for a lot of investors. And, and there are a lot of folks that don't want to do it all themselves. And what I'm having a dickens of a time finding are the hourly advisors, the low cost advisors who do very good work in terms of, of, of financial planning and maybe tax planning, maybe estate planning, but they really like to keep their work simple. It isn't even about the customer because if, if you think about it, if you got somebody else helping you apply the, our portfolios, then you're off the hook. Somebody else is going to take care of that for you. Uh, and and uh, Or if you're going to do it, we want your advisor to understand what you're trying to accomplish. That is more difficult than one would think it needs to be uh, to get people to, uh, to find good planning help at the same time as they apply our strategies. And I do believe it could be your configurator that will help those advisors see uh, how these particular portfolios lay out and the risk and the expenses. 
And it might, for the first time, be easier to find the hourly person to help folks that don't want to do this all themselves. So uh, a very important thank you to you for putting this together. Uh, it was a surprise. I love the surprises. <laughs> my, my wife told me, uh, I have something to share you here, share with you here. This was from dinner last night. Let's see if I can get it to focus. I can't. Oh, a sizable raise is in your near future. Are you going back to work someplace <laughs> where people pay you? Oh, no. No, no, no. You're supposed to double my salary. Okay. It is done. <laughs> your, your dream is is taken care of. That's great. Good, good to know that the hard work is compensated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. So we, I do have some Q and A's here. I think we should be diving into, uh, and, uh, uh, th I like this one. Does active management ever make sense or are all people better off with an index based do it yourself strategy. And he goes on to say, I've heard the argument that even if some managers outperform, there will be a reversion to the mean and that outperformance only lasts at best a couple or three years. And I've, I've got some statistics here, but what do you think? I mean, is there a case for active management? You know, I uh, got a correction from Larry Swedro when I put in my book that uh, that active management doesn't pay that, you know, the evidence is that that active managers can't beat the market. And he challenged me on it because he said that the evidence is that active management can beat the market, but that in the funds that are available to retail investors, the active managers charge enough that they keep all of the advantage. And I, I think that that's genuinely true. And if you think that those people that are generating that advantage are doing it full time with connections to the industry, 99.9% .9 of us should ignore active management because uh, the funds aren't going to give it to us and we're not going to invest that kind of intensity ourselves. So, um, yeah, I I don't think I, I don't think active management is relevant to the vast vast majority of of the population. Now I've got one fellow that has been emailing me wonderful articles and 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 studies. Uh, it seems like for a decade, he is a big big fan of healthcare companies for the long term and thinks at the same time as one might consider putting small cap value uh, in uh, to a uh, portfolio for a lifetime that, uh, that one might also consider in terms of similar kinds of, if not even better performance, uh, the sector, just that healthcare sector. Any comment about that? And that implies, by the way, normally active management, not always, but normally. Uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, people always come up with their favorite strategies. It could be technology, it could be dividend stocks, it could be healthcare, uh, and they could be right. Uh, you you won't know until the other end of it. The thing I like about the work that we do is that we're focused on things that are evergreen. Uh, mm -hmm. we're focused on taking advantage of as much history as we can get. So we go back to 1928 on many of our analyses. And when a new year of information comes in, it's a very small percentage of the total. So it's unlikely to change your strategy. You know, we look at all of the history. So when I hear somebody like that come in with a healthcare strategy, it's not an evergreen strategy, I don't think. I think he's saying under the current demographics, aging population, current regulatory environment, current level of, of innovation, this strategy is likely to do well for a number of years, which then begs the question, how many years? When does it change? 
uh, what what regulatory uh, environment change would make you no longer favor that strategy? Right. What demographic change would make you no longer favor that strategy? I don't have time for that. I, I, I don't have time to go and, and figure out these magical things that come in, in and out of favor. I, I do have a lot of time to apply to trying to figure out evergreen strategies that I can apply and that I can recommend to other people apply that are going to have lasting value. Well, and, and thank you. And let me give you uh, just one of the studies about recent performance and, and, and how successful that tends to be. There's a S and P persistent scoreboard. Uh, and what they find is that, uh, uh, if a, if, if, a particular fund has outperformed in in a in a year uh, that they are less than fifty percent of them are going to outperform over a three year period. And by the way, of the group that do become the hot performers uh, after five years, about twenty percent end up in the bottom quartile that you could be amongst the, the, the worst performers. It is probably the biggest sales pitch in the business is we can make you more money. And it is the least documented sales pitch uh, in terms of the actual probabilities of managers being able to do that. And boy, it is it, it certainly is enticing which is why young people got caught up in cryptocurrency. What can be wrong with putting money into something that goes up? I mean, how can you <laughs> how can you fight that sales pitch? And nothing, course, we, nothing until it goes down. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. All right. Well, let me let me look here. I got a couple more. Um, this was this this one. I just wanted I wanted to discuss. I get emails and I say I'm not going to re respond to these kind of emails. And they go into a whole lot of, uh, of history. And they want me to know what their portfolio, what they're holding. And, and I think, is there some reason that I should talk with this person? Will I learn something that I can share with the people who follow our work if I end up spending an hour with this person on the phone? And... And I've seen a lot of the emails that you send out, Chris. You are spending a lot of time on some of the folks that, that have asked questions. So I wouldn't be surprised if you spent more time than I have. But this was one I smelled the possibility of a story. And, and, and it's, it's a 73-year-old retiree who is about to fire his investment advisor. Well, he's got me. I want to talk. I want to find out why. And, and I know a little bit about that. They've used him for five years and four months. I mean, how's that for detail? And, uh, and my annual return since inception is approximately 3.5%. And he's got a 70-30 portfolio. Now, that is interesting to me because if I look at balanced portfolios over the last five years, it's a six to nine percent return, depending on how much equity you've got in that portfolio. And he goes on. He says that his portfolio, uh, um, by the way, it's it's down to one point three million, but he lost about five hundred thousand dollars in the last year. I'm thinking growth. I'm thinking somebody sold him on the idea is to put your some money someplace where you can make some real money. I don't know this for a fact, but, uh, um, but I thought, oh, this is somebody we can help. He says, I would like to become a do-it-yourself investor, but I'm a little nervous, but I'm a little nervous. And here's somebody who, by the way, uh, I believe if I recall right, had tried getting aggressive a long time ago, and it didn't work out. Here it happened again, and it hasn't worked out. And, and, and by the way, he has been following our work for some time because he said he's got seven grandchildren, and um, he, he set up funds for them following our advice five years ago. So he knows our work. And I'm thinking, 
you know, I can probably get this guy to build a portfolio. Maybe it would be the four fund U.S. because he might be more uh, country centric than 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 some investors might be because he doesn't have a lot of experience with investing, from what I can tell. But at the end of the conversation, I thought, you know, what this guy needs to stay the course is a couple of funds. That are and he does he doesn't need a very good return. If if he could get a six percent return, he's home free. Uh, and what he told me about himself financially, he doesn't have to take a lot of risk. He doesn't have to worry about dollar cost averaging into things because the whole thing might explode in his face. I thought here is Vanguard balanced fund guy. Here is somebody who doesn't need to try to have some big and some small and some value and some growth and some U.S. and some international and some REITs and some emerging markets. That something in there is going to blow up along the way, and that's just going to be more than he can handle. And so I showed him those two funds, the Wellesley and the Wellington. Now, what did I find out that I just knew he was going to like? Well, I found out that they were in the top quartile for the last three, five, 10, and 15 years. And we've been talking about how difficult it is to end up in the top quartile being smart. And this is not about being smart so much as it has just been in a balanced portfolio with an overweighting to large value, which you get there with those two funds. Not totally value, but a lot of value. And, uh, and so, uh, and I also mentioned, because he was aware of your work, he wants to maybe put 10% in small cap value. And so he's going to have a portfolio that's basically 50-50. What do you think that 10% uh, thrown on top of the pile might mean to him at age 73 over the next 20 years? What do you think? You know, I'd have to go run the numbers, but I, I think it probably is at least worth a half a percent added return. You know, it's kind of the opposite of bonds. And we know that when you add bonds, you take off a half a percent. And more importantly, it's meaningful diversification. So it it uh, will likely give him some returns that are not in sync with the other things he's got going on, and that may improve the safe withdrawal rate or resilience of the portfolio. Uh, so, yeah, I I think that that would not be a bad move. Yeah, you just you just said something very quickly. I want to make sure people heard. You mentioned the bonds and a half a percent, and go through that. Why? What were you talking about? Bonds and a half a percent. Well, in the fine tuning tables that you and Daryl uh, promote every year, and they they uh, as you add ten percent in bonds, uh, pretty much with every ten percent you add in the allocation of the overall portfolio, you lower the return of the portfolio by about a half a percent, which kind of makes sense uh, because uh, you know bonds the the delta in bonds to uh, the uh, expected return of equities is maybe on the order of 5%, yeah. right? Four or 5%. Mm -hmm. So if I use that same logic and think about, well, what's your expected return in a balanced portfolio versus the expected return in small cap value, eh, it's probably a 5% difference there as well, which is how you would get to that half a percent for yeah. every 10% allocation. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrific. Well, I tell you, it was a fun conversation, and and in fact, I thought it had some 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 good lessons. Uh, here's one I, I, I want to read. This he says such nice things about you, Chris. He says I want to begin by thanking you and Chris Pedersen so much for the time and work that you both put in helping individual investors like me try and navigate the most prudent ways to save for myself and future generations. I'm 36 years old, so you could say that I may be a little late in the game to fully take advantage of the compounding potential that your two-fund approach allows. I have seven and 11-year-old sons who I'm already grooming to be lifelong investors 
and should better reap the benefits of additional time in the market. So talk about, uh, I'm thinking there'll be a lot of people who don't get started until they're 36 and they do just fine. But what's the advice that you, you would give to somebody who obviously is committed to saving and likes the work that we do, but is this a person who should be any more in small cap value than what the two funds for life would suggest? You know, isn't it funny how, how old we think we all are? <laughs> <laughs> You and I would yes. surely love to be a 36 year old again. Yeah. Um, but a lifetime. He, uh, yeah. But a 36 year old, he's got decades ahead. He's got yeah. plenty of time for equities and small cap value to work for him. Plenty of time. Uh, and e even myself, you know, I'm in my 60s now. I'm likely to live another 30 years. And we know that small cap value historically has has per it's delivered a premium over every 20 year period we can look at going back in the past. So I've got time. Uh, yeah, he's got plenty of time. And the other thing to remember is that even though we don't know when these premiums and returns come in, it's unknown. It's not guaranteed. It's uncertain. Uh, the academics would tell you that the expected return for small cap value tomorrow is higher than the expected return for the market tomorrow. And the market's expected return tomorrow is higher than the expected return for fixed income. So uh, it, it's statistical. You never know when it's going to come in. It might come in in a day, a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. You may have to wait a long time. Uh, but the sooner you invest in something with the higher expected return, the more likely you are to get that expected return over the time you wait. Yeah. And, and I have to ask, because uh, I'll just share with the folks who are listening or watching, uh, Chris and I had an opportunity to spend an hour approximately, maybe it was longer, with two people from uh, the Avantis organization who know the inside of how they construct their portfolios and, and the studies that they've done uh, that uh, to us are, are, are fascinating. But I have to ask, did you come away thinking we, we upped the probabilities of getting the return that we hoped we would get for the people we're trying to help? I came away as confident as ever that the Avantis funds that we've recommended are good choices. I, I've always liked the pedigree of the company, uh, the uh, the academic orientation of their work, mm -hmm. the emphasis on good business fundamentals in terms of how they screen companies. Uh, so they've they've been uh, very helpful to us, but not in a way that I think has unduly biased us in in any way. I, I feel very comfortable with what they're doing and. Uh, more than anything, I, w I walked away from it thinking this is pretty cool. We talked to some in industry insiders and we kind of we understood everything. And we held our own and <laughs> I didn't well, feel now, snowed now under. To be any fair, point. Yeah, to be fair, Chris, you understood it. I saw it in your eyes. You were on top of the conversation. <laughs> I, I still keep asking myself, how old am I? All right. Let me see what else I've got here uh, for uh, some questions for the day. I know we have this one young fellow who, who has lots of, 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 of questions for us. And uh, he's kind of, he's new to us. He's new to the kind of thinking that we have. And I'm thinking of Winston, by the way, uh, who, who really does have a, just a lot of questions about, for example, do you guys reinvest dividends from your ETFs or do you collect them for income for other purchases. Do you have a brief answer to that? I, I've set them to reinvest just so that I don't end up with a cash drag on the portfolio. Mm. Uh, if you don't automatically reinvest, then over time, if you haven't gone into rebalance periodically, you can end up with a surprisingly big chunk of cash. Uh, it can just kind of creep up on you and you're, you're not getting any return on that. Uh, if you have a um, if you have a taxable account, 
it may be more efficient for you to go in periodically and invest those dividends, uh, not set them to automatically invest, but to invest them in a way that rebalances the portfolio so that you don't find that you have to sell and, and repurchase at some later date to undo effectively a reinvestment that happened automatically along the way. So um, I, I think there is there are pros and cons to both sides, but I think in a tax deferred account, automatic reinvestment is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and his another question is, uh, I'm in the process of buying Vanguard bond funds for my mom. I love it when the people who follow work, our work are helping their parents. Does it matter on any given day when they are purchased? And let's not just think about bond. Let's just think about any any purchase that we are making, particularly ETFs, and you and and you might just take a second and talk about the difference between ETFs and mutual funds, but uh, a little guidance, and we and we we got some of this from the folks at, at Avantis yesterday, um, guidance about timing of a daily kind of purchase. Yeah, um, e the difference between ETFs and mutual funds in terms of how they trade is that ETFs trade like a stock and mutual funds trade at the end of the day at the underlying net asset value. Um, there's also the difference that you can buy mutual funds in a dollar amount and you buy ETFs typically in shares unless you're buying somewhere where they do fractional shares. Uh, and more and more brokerages support fractional shares, so that second difference is smaller. Uh, the The nice thing about a mutual fund is if if you have $1,000 you want to invest, you don't have to worry about timing or anything. You just say, I'm going to place an order to buy a $1,000 worth of this fund, and at the end of the day, it happens. Uh, with an ETF, because it trades throughout the day, you have the opportunity to get a better price or a worse price, depending on what's going on in the market at the time. And so we asked, like you said, we asked Avantis yesterday and he had four pieces of advice. Number one, he said, don't don't buy during the or, or trade during the first half hour of the day because there's odd things that are going on with arbitrage and people trying to figure out what the news meant and where the fair prices are for all the underlying assets. So um, it's better to wait. Uh, number two, um, I, if you are going to do a, uh, uh, well, he, he advised not to do a market, uh, a market price purchase because sometimes the market price can be off of what it should be. You're better off doing a limit order, you know, and figuring out a price that is uh, is fair and and in figuring out what a fair price would be try and get real-time quotes a lot of brokerages provide them now yahoo finance may provide them as well i think he recommended that and then he said a marketable limit order would be uh like one to two pennies over the asking price uh, over over the asking price in the market and he advised against trying to be greedy and and doing more than that um and uh, that was pretty much it. So he was he was recommending time of day, not early. I would say not at the very end of the day either, because uh, things can go crazy then. Um, but I think uh, Winston might also be asking, and I'll flip this around and ask this part to you. He may also be asking, you know, what about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or this week, this month, next month? What's yeah. your advice to him on that? Well, I, I told him. Just, just to go ahead and do it. Yeah. Don't try to market time. Um, because if you did a study and you didn't do this, you did the study over the last 10 years, you very likely would come to a conclusion that would be wrong for the next 10 years. So it's, it, it is probably uh, not worth the effort. And by the way, I think uh, the Avantis with the small cap value, which I would think could have a, a, a potentially a wider spread. Uh, they said there was a penny spread typically on that. So that is so, that's a very, as narrow a difference as you can get, which is, which is great uh, to know that people are likely, if they're not doing it at 
the, the, the tougher times beginning or the end are going to get a very small uh, uh, cost to get in. Pay, paying the ask is not going to be expensive, but they certainly did recommend to put that limit order in just a little bit above so that you don't get, and they, and they gave you, what were they gave several examples of the kinds of things that can happen. I think one of them was the specialist, the, the market maker can just be away yeah. uh, for a few minutes. And, and, uh, uh, and, and in that few minutes, something could happen just because they weren't right there. He also made a point I didn't appreciate, which is that we think of this as a tax on ETFs. Uh, you know, we're aware of a lot of advantages of ETFs. They're more tax efficient um, in terms of not distributing uh, the capital gains that are created by others or by trading nearly as often or as much as mutual funds. But but we think of that bid ask spread as a a tax on your overall investment that you have to pay every time you purchase. And he made the point that mutual funds actually carry a lot of hidden costs that are comparable. Um, just stuff that goes on behind the scenes that that you never see reported to the investor. But you know, it costs money to do the trades and they pay the bid ask spreads when they're buying and selling. And so his point was not to get hung up on that too much. And I, I thought it was very valid. Yeah, I, I, I get the sense. I, I too learned things about what goes on in mutual funds, how they clear and settle up. It, it doesn't it doesn't happen in many cases till the next day. Mm -hmm. They don't know how much money needs to be added to the kitty or 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 even be taken out. So th there's a, a, a there are a lot of expenses that uh, the public does does not know about. They're probably pennies. Uh, in fact, they made it clear that there is a cost to get a to, to get a, an account established with an ETF. And it's probably about a penny a share that in, in essence, there is that, that cost of that bid as spread is the cost of, of in, in essence, uh, establishing that account to, uh, to, to, to make you part of the club, if you will. Um, oh, I know one other topic. I know, uh, speaking of bonds, you shared a long-term study going back to the 1700s, was it not, about mm -hmm. bonds? Yep. And the returns of bonds. Uh, I'm guessing you don't have that right there. But but can you just make a, comments about what you learned from that long-term study about bonds? The gist of it is that bonds don't go up and down as fast as stocks, Good. but they tend to trend in, in the same direction for very long periods of time, which is interesting. Uh, and this study, which uh, we can provide the link in the show notes, oh, uh, it, it was from Global Financial Data, I believe. Uh, it, it walks through how over centuries the regimen that bonds lived in so to speak was dominated by different government policy different uh, state ownership of equities policy different uh, government policy towards controlling inflation and so that i i mean the two big takeaways for me from it were number one uh, bonds over the very very long term roughly deliver inflation you, you roughly get a, uh, a return that preserves your capital, which is why you invest in bonds in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. You're not expecting to invest in bonds because it's going to be the engine that drives you know, your future uh, wealth. It's, it's going to preserve your capital. And it historically has done that. And then number two, they just don't, they don't move as fast, but they can go through these very long trends of uh, multiple decades of downward or multiple decades of upward kind of uh, of movement. And I find that really interesting because it's just such a different asset class from equities. And, and in your portfolio, 
the purpose of bonds? What? It's a shock absorber. It's a shock absorber. It's a shock absorber. So it's it's there to reduce the volatility yeah. and give me the ability to um, uh, go through long periods of time when I don't have to sell equities if I need to because uh, because the market is down and dirty and and I want to live off more stable uh, assets. Yep. And and people will notice that that Daryl, the big D there on the screen, uh, he is joining us today, but he just had uh, a cataract surgery, and uh, and and so he's uh, uh, cho chosen to just uh, uh, be a silent partner. But he's when he's back with us, we're going to talk with him about his approach to bonds. I really found it quite interesting. And, uh, and, and, and worth sharing because uh, it certainly isn't the way that bonds have been part of, of my portfolio. So, well, you've done it again, Chris. I don't know if there's anything else on your agenda today, but thank you for the configurator. I hope folks will respond. We, we don't ask you for a lot here, but boy, this, isn't, this is a point where you can help us. I will tell you that one thing, when I saw the configurator, and of course you mentioned we have the investment, lifetime investment calculator now, uh, those two, the, the, the lifetime investment calculator, uh, it will show the returns of, of bonds in 10% increments. Your new configurator allows somebody to put 35% in bonds, correct? So or 21% or, or 21, yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's in 1% increments, yeah. So this is not going to tie directly into the, the calculator that we have, uh, at, at least as I know it. Well, you, you're bringing up a really important point too, which is that whenever you look at an asset class set of back tests like we show in Daryl's fine tuning tables or in the uh, the lifetime calculator that uh, that Craig has created, you're looking at what you would have gotten had you invested in the you can think of it as the iconic or best example of those asset classes over that period of time. We use real return histories wherever possible. Uh, we use indexes to fill some gaps and burden them with expenses to, to fill those gaps. Uh, but the only way you would have gotten that return is if you had invested in those iconic best exemplars of those asset classes. And one of the things you can see in the configurator I've created is that not all funds are created equal. They're not all the best exemplar. So uh, if you invest, for example, in the T row price portfolios, they have a higher expense ratio and they're bigger and they're less value -y, And consequently, you would expect a different ride. Um, you'd expect not necessarily that it would be better or worse. Maybe the growth part would do better for 10 years or 15 years, but over the very, very long term, you would expect them not to do quite as well as the ones that are more value in and, and uh, smaller. So yeah, it's, um, they're not the same thing. It's apples and oranges. And, and there's another aspect uh, going back to that question we had regarding the, the active versus passive and is there room for active and and you make the case that or larry swedro says there are people who have outperformed uh, the market and that doesn't mean they will in the future but we also know that when they do look at the range of returns of active managers remember on that study i mentioned uh out of standard and poor's that um, twenty percent uh, of those people, the fund managers who were at the top in the top quartile, uh, ended up at the bottom quartile uh, five years out. That is typically in equities could be a two percent difference in return from being in that upper quartile, 
And when we have such a high probability of being in that upper quartile with indexes, why would we want to take the risk that we're going to end up with somebody so very well-intentioned? This is not a matter of people uh, taking advantage of you by performing poorly. They want it more than you do to hit hit to the home run rather than to be in the bottom quartile. So it is, it is amazingly easy. This is the part I just love. It is so easy to be in that upper quartile when we see that over 20 year periods, index funds are going to likely be in the top, not the upper quartile, but the decile, the top 10%. And so as, as in terms of X, your word you used. Expected returns? Well, no, the, the, the best. You used the word. Oh, for the exemplars. Exemplar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you want to be in the exemplar, there is a chance to be there. And uh, how many times in our life do we get to be amongst the best by being something that is so absolutely easy to do? So, again, Chris, thanks to you. Daryl, behind the screen, uh, the, 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 the wizard back there. Thanks for all of your work and thanks to you for joining us, uh, hopefully on a regular basis. I hope this information is helpful and please drop Chris a line, tell him what we can do to make this better. Thanks again. Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.